there, welcome to the e-commerce nurse podcast, our sixth episode. I'm Karina McLeod, ex-Amazonian consultant and founder of e-commerce nurse and vendor society. Today we're going to be talking about the importance of brands having a social media presence in today's world. We have a special guest, Steph Bennett. Steph is a social media guru and a very good friend of mine. As a director of Batten Hall, an award-winning marketing communications agency, and with over 15 years working in marketing, Steph brings a wealth of experience working with industry-leading brands when it comes to digital communications. Good evening, Steph. So pleased to have you on our show. I'm really excited to talk to you today about social media. Good evening, Karina. Lovely to be speaking to you on my favourite topic. It's really exciting. Great. So let's jump in and talk about social media. Now, there's an influx of newly evolving brands in the online retail world. And part of this is down to Amazon incentivizing businesses to create their own private label, but also Far East sourcing becoming more accessible. But the question is, can a brand really reach their true potential by solely selling on, for example, Amazon, or do they need to have a social presence to maximize that potential in the online world? That's a really interesting question. And I think the most important thing to consider here is, is it a brand a brand or is it a brand a product? Because if we're talking about products on Amazon, they are so vast. You can get everything from nails and ladders through to kind of like Disney products. It's, it's so crazy. So whenever I'm kind of like looking at this kind of question, I'm tackling it from a mentality of a brand um brand is something that has emotional value instead of just having a straight function and when you have an emotional value you can use social media to elevate its status elevate the awareness around it and help you to drive uh, traffic to your amazon page and hopefully make sales off the back of it that's a really interesting point about the emotion because I think that is a key thing though and a key difference here with, with Amazon is Amazon is very transactional based and that's the part that's missing. So yes, you've got these newly evolving brands on Amazon, but how do you really get that tap into that emotion uh, when introducing a new brand into to the market solely on Amazon alone? Yeah, so in terms of like actually getting that brand known, so in my mind, when I go to Amazon, I'm already seeking out a product. Like there's something I need, there's something I want. Um, whereas if I am on Instagram or Facebook and I'm looking at different things that are going on, they're very much fit into my lifestyle. So quite often if I'm buying something that I've seen on social media, it's because I've made a connection to it. I have um, started to kind of like get interested about who they are, what they stand for, what the quality of the product is, you know, um, I've got a lot of friends at the moment with babies and you see uh, social advertising play a very big part in that because we, I am of an age where that is very much a focal point for brands to sell to me. So I will see things like baby blankets or toys or uh, clothing, things like that. And so if I am in that space, if I am in that mindset and they link through and there's stuff that are being sold on Amazon, then it's something that's relative to me. And it takes time on social media to build up that brand. Whereas I think on Amazon, because it is, if you are going straight in to find the product, you're diving straight in to get exactly what you want. Um, so if you are not a known brand, it can be quite tricky. That can be a differentiator um, in which one you choose over the other. It can be a differentiator in how much you pay one over the other. Um, is that your experience as well? Yeah, definitely. And I guess it's an interesting point. It's almost, um, there are two things. There's the brand, uh, a well-known brand versus uh, an up-and-coming brand, but also where, almost where that customer is in the journey. So there's a customer that might naturally be looking for baby blankets. They type in baby blankets and the product appears. But there's also this point of where that customer might not have even been considering it or considering uh, something similar um, or a, a different product that might uh, correlate slightly with that product that they wouldn't come on to Amazon. But if it's there in front of them on social media, it might then get their attention for them to then 
maybe follow up or engage a bit and then start understanding more about that product when they next come onto Amazon. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, there's a big trend for, like, direct-to-consumer like, marketing these days without having, like, an offline shop or kind of like a you, – you're literally starting your brand from scratch on the internet. And, you know, you do need to kind of, like, build that awareness up, build that kind of um, – that brand entity up. So it is – whether you're coming in and you're just stumbling across it because you're looking for something else or you're, it's in your periphery. And the great thing is with social media, it can be so targeted. And I think this is why we see brands gravitate towards it so much more these days. Um, there's a massive, massive focus on metrics, um, which is really fascinating to me because if I go back to kind of like very, very early days of like studying marketing, practicing marketing, um, even doing it after advertising, you have a number of people that could potentially see your adverts um, and people are okay. If you just give them that number, they're okay with that. Whereas now, every hour of every day, somebody wants to know how many impressions have we got now? How much reach have we got? How many engagements have we got? Uh, how many people have shared this post? What's going on with them? And the minutia of detail that you can get out of um, a single Instagram post is incredible and it's distracting as well. Um, there is, from a social media content perspective, you have lots and lots of posts that can go out um, with different messages, with different types of images. And people think that broadcast is the only way to play because they've got something they want to tell somebody and so they're going to put it on their social network. And once it's there, they've done their job. So now go and buy it. And that's very cold and it's not very connective and it's not going to kind of make people go, right, I need to have that next time. Whereas if you're considering what your content is and you're kind of like tapping into something that's not as direct, you're thinking about how you can start a conversation with those, those people who are viewing your content, um, then you have kind of taken them on to the next stage in that customer journey. It's no longer just a billboard that you're kind of like putting up to someone in the, on the internet that they can drive past. You're actually kind of like take, making it almost like a gas station. You want to go in, you want to have a look, see what you can use, see what you can try. You might not buy anything that time, but you know what you can get if you need it. Do you know what I mean? Definitely. That's a really good example, uh, I guess, with a billboard is that, yeah, that's almost just like an ad placement. But then there's this next stage where nowadays, uh, I guess customers have got used to having information and being fed a lot more information and they want that. And so the fact is that they can actually click on that and then start getting more information. And they're still not even at that point probably to even consider going to purchase anything. But they're, it's like they're a sponge. They want to know more. They want to understand that brand more. It's caught their attention. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's that's really interesting. And another point that's interesting that you made is about well, the the metric side of things as actually even some businesses are, well, I'm spending a lot. It's not giving me the results that I need or this, this and that. But sometimes, you know, you're actually paying for data. Um, you're paying for re to understand the customer. And maybe that customer didn't engage, but I guess you've got that metrics that tells you that that customer didn't engage. And then the customer that you always thought that might have been your typical customer possibly isn't yeah and it's, it's, it's fascinating you know we've worked with um beauty brands over the years um at my company and they instead of targeting people who worked as beauty bloggers or kind of like people who were kind of looking to feel glossy actually kind of shifting focus a little bit and targeting people who needed beauty products skin products like people who do lots of sports or people are outdoors a lot or people who stay up too late or you know those kind of things can really shift your entire strategy your entire thinking and actually deliver better results so you know again going back to kind of traditional kind of ways of marketing you would have all your a b demographics and everything be perfect and all this research that you gathered over the last two years. And then from that point of two years, then you start to use it. Now, in social media land, you take data every single day. There's a way to see how things are shifting, what people are talking about, um, how people are engaging. If I go to someone's Instagram feed for a product, I look down at all the different things that are on there, look at the 
messages they're, they're kind of offering and also the engagement or the people the comments that people are making underneath them um you click on a hashtag you can see something about a product with people's customer experiences and when people are talking on social media i only have to think of the word customer words customer service for you to kind of understand that people are so honest they hide behind this digital wall and they will tell things as they as they are when it comes to reviews when you look at things like you know amazon or websites or kind of you know tripadvisor wherever you look they can be very polar it's either really really good or really really bad um so when you're seeing people just naturally commenting about what they like and what they do there's no pressure there's no stars there's no nothing it's just real raw data and information and you know once you kind of like look at the trends in what people are saying about your brand or the trends of what people are saying about the thing that they need that could be your brand then you start to get a better understanding of who your audience really should be that's an interesting yeah that and, and what you say about almost the the honesty element i mean amazon is trying to build a, a review program that's uh that is an honest review program, but there are questions. There's been lots of events in the past where businesses have almost been paying for positive reviews, and it's really damaged how much people believe in those, how much they trust those reviews. And I guess then there's a question there as in, you know, where customers go onto Amazon, they're like, oh, it's got five-star review, four-star review. Oh, it's definitely good, I'll buy it. Or is there a point where more and more people are starting to think, not trust those systems, but trust social media where it's a bit more real and authentic and actually then going and looking at that brand then and seeing have they got social media presence and then what what's the kind of interaction going on with that brand? So is that five-star review really a five-star review, if that makes sense? Yeah, totally. You tapped into something really interesting when you said that because, you know, the authenticity of anything online is a challenge and social media is not a stranger to inauthenticity, if that's a word. Is inauthenticity a word? If it isn't, I've just made it up. Um, a new word. <laughs> <laughs> add that to the digital dictionary. Um, so, but yeah, it, there's a lot of fake news. Uh, there are um, people who buy followers. There are people who equally by comments. I myself have a, a yoga account and I follow lots of yogis, lots of people in the industry. And I know immediately when one of these yogis or yoga brands or whatever has hired a or paid for a service that auto comments. So it'll be things like I'll put a video up of myself doing a yoga practice and someone's like, oh my God, I love that photo. That's, you know, such a beautiful view of the, of the beach. And I'm like, no, no, that's me on a yoga mat doing a sequence because it's just like a bot kind of system. But the more that person is being seen to be engaging with other people, the more their profile becomes um, more prominent and it beats the algorithms. So when people are paying for these services, they're doing it, but actually, they're doing it in a really, really fake way, in a really obvious way. And so from a, an authenticity and a would I want to engage with this person long term uh, factor, it's not happening. It's not right. Um, we've seen lots of stuff where products, uh, products and brands are, using, uh, are being used by influencers, um, sometimes gifted, sometimes paid for. Sometimes they just really genuinely like the product and they want to say things about it. Um, but knowing where things can be authentic or not is important. And it's something that the advertising standards industry is addressing and in making people um, be honest about what they're doing. So you'll see hashtag ad or hashtag gifted in people's posts or paid partnerships. And that these are really, really valuable ways of going about things for brands and products. Um, but it's making sure that you do your research before you start working with an influencer to see um, how authentic they are. Um, there are lots of tools out there in the market to be able to um, to assess the authenticity of followers. So one of them is called Hype Auditor, and it will go in and tell you uh, the number of bots or fake fans or followers that somebody has on Instagram in particular. Um, we 
we did it a couple of years ago there's a, a tv show over in the uk called love island and lots of it's like a reality show lots of kind of mid-tier influencers kind of go in there and then all of a sudden their their followers blow up and they'll suddenly go on like a million followers and you can see where bots have started to kind of amass on their follower count and when a an influencer is selling you their services they are selling you that this huge number of people that you can reach via them so if you've got someone who's a million followers but only 500,000 of them are actually real your kind of reach is actually diminishing like massively um so these are things like you as a brand product service i would say don't worry too much about kind of getting into nitty gritty i think this is where you need to speak to experts this is where you know you've got other things to worry about get on with kind of like letting somebody else kind of do that research for you because if you've got those right people then your product can do really really well uh, in the right hands with the right people the right influencers and even down to looking at are these products relevant for the people I want to target? So if someone is a sports influencer, um, what kind of products are going to be the most relevant to them in their day to day? Well, actually that could be just sporty things, but also if they, if they're authentic enough, they'll show you what's going on in their life in their day to day. What are they doing? Do they need a Nutribullet? Do they need a, um, a new picture frame because they told you the other day that they actually had to kind of like do some kind of workout uh, to me in order to kind of get their muscles pumping so they could actually go and hang that picture. There are like, so many different things, but it's, it takes uh, a keen eye to see what's going on. Um, and it's a, it's a minefield. Sorry, I'm babbling on here. <laughs> no, no, I mean, that's, that's really interesting. I guess that, that highlights that there's two, there's two directions in which really you could go when you're, you're dealing with social media. There's, there's the, the social presence that you have as a brand. Let's say you have a Facebook page or I feel like I'm old school saying Facebook because I got told by someone that that's not cool anymore. But um, <laughs> you could have an, an Instagram, um, you know, an Instagram account for your brand. But then that's all based on your brand. And there's this other point that you're, you're talking about, which I think is this, this up and coming part, uh, or we believe it to be, and we've been speaking to clients about, about ways in which they can do this, is this influence part where they already have that social media presence. It's not that they, they need to go and, and build a brand. It's about their new sort of thinking about working with people that have already created an audience, an audience that's already engaged in getting them to then talk about your product as that's another another way in terms of how you can get your your product visible and really gain that um customer trust as well yeah exactly if you, especially if you're a new brand like uh, there there is you need to know who you are what you stand for as a brand in the first place what are you what are you choosing to be what's your identity and then that helps you build your social presence um what do you what do you want to do? What can you offer your audience? And then from there, when you're kind of like still quite small, you can have really great content. You can have an amazing Instagram feed or an amazing Facebook page. If no one's there to see it yet, how are you going to attract people there? And that's where you start partnering with either other brands or influencers to help them be the mouthpiece for you to endorse what you're doing, to kind of like to, to show how they're using it, to show why it makes their lives better. Um, and they're, they're basically like the new TV advertising in my mind. There's not many times where I sit down these days and actually watch TV adverts. Um, I'm a Netflix girl, so everything I see is usually through there. Whereas on social media, my thumb, I have one thumb that's thinner than the other because I use it so much on my apps. Um, <laughs> true story. <laughs> um, it works out. Uh, but I, I'm always on these different places. So I'm get fed all these different adverts. Um, but I get fed adverts that are really relevant because I, I look at particular types of things on social media. So, or I'm a particular type of um, demographic. I live in London. I'm in my late thirties. You know, I'm female. These, those are kind of like top level. But the targeting you can do is so deep in terms of behaviours and interests, and um, yeah, you can just get, you can go wild and really find the right kind of people uh, to reach. 
Yeah, I really like that idea. So it's almost like there's a two two stage approach for those those newly evolving brands. Or it doesn't have to be a newly evolving brand. It might be a brand that just doesn't have any social media presence. And if they're thinking about having that, but they're because we, we speak with a number of brands and we go, well, what are you doing on social media? And they're like, oh, nothing. And it's really hard to get that wheel going. But this influencer way is a great way to start getting that wheel turning to get their brand known to help them build then their own social media following that can then um, help boost the, their their business and I guess with this boost of business on Amazon I mean a lot of people come to Am they originally have come to Amazon based on they know that they can find something uh, for a really good price or cheaper than elsewhere. And, and that seems to be changing a lot more as more and more businesses uh, or customers are, are now looking to almost, they, they will pay a premium for a product that has a better review. And it's not just about price with Amazon, it's also about the service that they get with Amazon and getting prime delivery and so forth. Would you say that price is still when it comes to shopping on Amazon, price is still an underlying factor that's going to really ultimately uh, make help the customer make that buying decision? Or actually, can a social somebody's social media presence start influencing that buying decision as well? Yeah, I think it's. I mean, price is always going to be important, but especially if it's competitive as a product. Um, it can be a, a game changing impact with somebody's on promo, for example, you know, immediately if that's the only thing that you're kind of like choosing between, if they are like like for like pretty much the same, but one of them is like cheaper, you're probably gonna go for the cheaper one, unless you've got this emotional connection. So if you know somebody else uh, who's a friend or an influencer or has been talking about it on social media and it's got some credibility that makes it stand apart from just you know the brand or you know the product or it looks nice then it's it can be it can be a huge um a huge thing that actually tips over that kind of price uh barrier in your mind so for example fitness trackers i've been looking at fitness trackers now for probably a year i have about three or four of them sitting in my amazon basket i'm the worst customer i really apologize to anybody if you're a fitness tracker brand <laughs> um listening. Um, but I will sit there and look at them because I'm not entirely sure still what I want from a fitness tracker. Um, so I might get swayed suddenly by a price and then I go, oh, but do I actually really want it? But then I'll look on uh, Instagram every now and again, I'll see all these other fitness people using them or talking about them. And I still am creating this decision-making process in my mind as to when, when that tipping point comes and then when I buy it. Um, so for, from a brand perspective, I am definitely kind of like drawn to the ones that I am more familiar with rather than the ones I'm not so much. Um, for example, I know uh, Bella Beat, I see a lot because it looks pretty. It's a jewelry-based fitness tracker. Uh, Fitbit I've used in the past, but I don't see a lot of people talking about it on social media. So it's kind of like, who do your friends talk about? Do, like, you know, what kind of things do they talk about? And my friends are the way that I can see social media, the people I follow in that sense when I'm looking for recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, if it's somebody who's not so much anymore, what can they do to actually get my attention? If somebody who I'm following is suddenly going to start screaming about Fitbit and how it's the most amazing product uh, and I really need to get one, I might start to think differently. And I know Fitbit is slightly cheaper than the Bella Beat, so that's, that's a win-win. <laughs> yeah, um, definitely. You've, you've touched on something interesting there, as in it's almost like what you, what sticks in your mind. So you, you know, a known brand sticks in your mind, but then there's this evolving brand that's appearing on social media a lot that you might not have necessarily heard of prior to that. And that then starts ticking in your mind as well. So then when you go to Amazon, yeah, you're looking for this watch and you know that, um, uh, for example, Fitbit, you 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 know of that brand, so you're naturally going to probably type that in your search just to check the pricing, just to check what what products are available. But you've now got this new brand that you you probably haven't have heard of before, but social media has uh, has started to catch your attention. So then you type that that brand in also on Amazon, and then you start making comparisons with that brand versus uh, with Fitbit as well. Yeah. 
And if you if there's a third brand in the mix and it looks great and it sounds great and I've never heard of it before, I might go and check out their Instagram account. Mm. And if I'm checking out their Instagram account and they've got good content, they might suddenly come into the into the mix. So it can it can be a full loop um, in terms of like knowledge base. And I think yeah, like I say, I'm I'm a worst shopper ever because I will spend far too long making decisions on some things or just buy things impulsively um in other occasions but like you know we need to factor in always the consumer journey is or the customer journey is always going to be a loop regardless of what you're doing unless it's something that you just need and you want it now and you're coming to get it yeah. um so if you're not a known brand or you're not a known product um and i see this more and more as well there's so many you know we, we work with a lot of very techie brands and so they're the first to market with these things. They're new, like brand new concepts. Um, they need to have a presence because they need to show people and tell people what it is they're offering and why it's innovative and why people do need these things. Um, you know, it's only, it's, it's still less than 15 years ago that like Facebook popped up. Yeah. Um, we didn't need it before. Now we need it. It's like the be all and end all. Um, and, you've, and you've even got like new social networks that are popping up um I've had a couple that have been a bit hit and miss but there's this new thing called TikTok um and it's a social media um app that may allow you to put little videos on but add music to the background um and it's kind of like a hybrid of Snapchat and Instagram and all these other things and Vine um but suddenly it's starting to uh get a bit more mass market instead of just be teen um teens are still consumers they're still customers mm -hmm. and teens are people who are suddenly going to have more money in the next five to ten years so yeah. getting in front of them if you've, got, if you've got the right product is important and um just literally this week there was an article i was reading about how the first element of shopping through that app has popped up and it's not the first one to do shopping through an app we've seen it on instagram in the last year um, they have shoppable posts now. You can actually put your product list behind an Instagram post and go straight through to buy a product. Um, and I think this is this is the new generation. This is how they are going to buy things. It's just it's going to be second nature. Yeah, that's um, uh, yeah, that's that's really interesting. And in there's there's lots of points there. I guess there's these newly evolving apps and. Um, and I guess the first question with the, that I have then with these newly evolving apps is how do brands, I mean, what are the apps that brands should be definitely be on and, and how much notice should brands be taking of these newly evolving apps? You know, some of them are like fads where, other, where others kind of hang around for, for some time or actually are going to be really established apps in a few years time. Yeah, so it's a huge question. So every year, uh, well, every month even at Baton Hall, we actually review the social networks around the world and their growth and what they're up to. And just last year, Instagram was the top growing uh, social media app. It was growing at like 20% uh, year on year um, mm -hmm. and it still continues to do so. Wow. But interestingly enough, its audience is only between 18 and 45 in the main. Um, now that's starting to shift. I'm starting to see my parents and other people popping up there now. Um, <laughs> in the same way we did with when Facebook started to get a bit more mass market. Yeah. Um, but Facebook is still the biggest. Yeah. Um, and it has the broadest audience. So depending on what your product is and who you're talking to and who you want to target and reach, there are different ways you can look at this. Um, you you still have things. YouTube is always a funny one because I, ne I never think of it as a technically a social network, but it kind of is. But the video content that can go up on YouTube is still incredibly important. It's not somewhere I see people hanging out in the same way that they used to in my set of people. Mm -hmm. um, but I see a lot of people, especially in kind of like the mid to late 20s, who will spend hours and hours just watching YouTube and Netflix. And that's all they do. So there is scope to be using if you've got product videos, if you've got kind of events that you're at, things like that, that will be relevant. And there's a space to put, to put those um, those assets, put those videos up there. Um, but you've got content, so Instagram and Facebook for sure, customer service, 
Twitter and Facebook Messenger mm -hmm. are probably the best places for that. Um, and then general kind of like visual video visuals can be on YouTube, but also on Instagram TV, the so IGTV. Um, there, those are just some of the main ones that we see day in day out that are used. Uh, Pinterest still has a big uh, like piece of the pie if you get into the right audience, um, especially things like homeware, uh, fashion, um, yeah, just kind of like stuff where you're cu curating ideas. Uh, people use those kind of places to to buy and to shop. So, That's, yeah, there's no specific answer. I think it would always come back to what's your brand, what's your product, who are you trying to reach. On what you're trying to achieve and then devise your social media strategy and your channel strategy based on that yeah that's 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 really key isn't it is, and that's what i'm hearing it's you know some of these there's different age groups some of them are good for video or content or customer service so there's so many out there but as you say what's your you need that social media strategy it isn't just going out there and just plastering content across wherever it's actually thinking about it a lot more strategically which kind of brings me on to another question of, of okay so you've got your you've got your social media strategy you know that the best channels for your product where you want to be you know if you're going to be focusing let's say on content um, and it's a uh, within a certain age group and you know that Facebook probably or even Instagram might be your best audience in terms of uh, frequency I know I'm on Instagram I'm on Facebook and I follow some people and I get really into them and then it's just way too much they start selling loads of stuff they're just constantly on there and I end up sort of uh, unfollowing them after some time despite getting really excited about them at the start because I've just I've just had enough of them is there a yeah. point in terms of where you don't want to overwhelm but at the same time you want to make sure you're present enough to be with it in that person's mind that they remember you as a brand so when they are going on somewhere like amazon they're like oh yeah i remember seeing them on instagram so i'm going to go and uh, check them out now i'm on amazon yeah it's a it's a massive point um i think there are there are a couple of things to factor in here so one is if you decide for example to put yourself on every social media channel and to create loads of content and then to put it out all the time and to manage your community all the time, it's a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of effort behind it. Um, same with social advertising, trying to kind of get the best version of that and target as many people as possible. It's it's a bit spray and pray. You know, you just kind of like, it's, if I keep doing all of this, something is going to stick. Um, whereas you want to just be efficient and effective. As a consumer, as a user of these social media platforms, when you're confronted by all this, overwhelming kind of like waves of content that are coming at you all the time it's a real turn off you know i have blocked or unfollowed or kind of like just generally left with a bad taste in my mouth if people are just shoving content at me all the time because i d only followed them because i thought they were cool mm. and now it's just annoying and that's not fun um on each social network there's probably like a a kind of a good kind of range of number of posts that you should post in any given day or week. So for example, in Twitter, there's much more freedom to be able to post uh, numerous times. Um, I think it was somebody, I was talking to somebody today who was saying that Netflix posts around 80 times a day. Wow. Um, because they have so much content. Mm. There's so many things to talk about. Um, so they've just got a running stream of things all the time. Um, and nobody minds because it's just kind of like if it pops up, they see it and they engage. And if they don't, it's OK. Um, whereas if you are kind of like someone on Instagram, I would say probably once a day on your main feed. Mm -hmm. And then curiously, you've got stories, which we haven't touched upon yet, um, which are your ephemeral content. So you can post up on stories and it disappears in 24 hours. So if you are, are kind of, if you're talking to someone, interviewing them, if you're at an event, if you're um, demoing something, you can post a sequence of stories that will be there and then disappear. So I'd say maybe 10 to 15 is plenty on a given day, um, but you can get away with posting more frequently um, 
on that kind of that particular part of the Instagram app. If it's Facebook, a couple of times a week is fine. If it's LinkedIn, pretty much the same. So maybe three, four times a week is actually just enough. Um, but it's the Instagram, it's the social media advertising, I think, is the one where people fall down because they'll get into a nice rhythm, they'll create content plans, they'll get everything right, and then they just put this always on uh, social ads live, or they'll put something and allow the frequency of opportunities to be seen to be free reign. Um, I've, I've had brands target me 16, 20 times a day with the same ad, uh, and it's absolutely infuriating mm -hmm. um the right kind of ad strategy will do something that's always on so like you might see it like every now and again um but also have something that's kind of campaign focused perhaps so if there's like a, a new product or it's come out in a different color or um there's a promotion on it's it just runs for a short period of time and there might be something that's just super relevant and targeted to you so if it's, um, you know, like just looking down the funnel of advertising, you know, that broad sweeping kind of like um, uh, it, you would fall into this huge bucket, then you kind of start to narrow it down and then you start to get into the really tailored, um, focused approach with those ads um, and tapping into a timely moment as well. So you don't need to advertise all the time if there is nothing really new or kind of innovative or um curious about what you're saying um if you try and think of a good example here but uh my yoga that's it's easy to kind of like focus on me when i talk about this so i would only do social media advertising if i'm hosting a particular yoga event or a workshop and i want to get people who i might not ordinarily speak to because i know i can target specific locations i can target specific audiences uh age groups um, interests and I will get that kind of content straight to them whereas if I just do it to my audience I know my audience is 50% international and only 50% UK then of that probably only about 5% are London based uh, and a lot of them are just my friends as opposed to my yoga students so I need to kind of like open up into a different um, space but yeah it's um, that's a yeah. really interesting point because so many businesses are looking at, oh, well, I've got X amount of followers, I've got this audience, so really I don't need to pay for paid because I've got this audience already, so it can be organic. But there's a point that you've just raised as in, okay, but what is your audience? How targeted? Because do you don't actually, do you get that data once you have all those followers? Do you really understand the demographics or can you only control that really through paid? So you can understand your demographics. So there's a lot of, um, in each of the social networks, there are extensive insights that you can get into for free. Um, awesome. And it's really, really helpful. Um, Instagram is probably the most limited currently. Um, there's always talks of like, you know, building that up. And I really hope they do soon because it's such a fundamental part of our business and the industry at the moment that the more information that we can get out there, the better we can serve um users and our um clients as well uh facebook is is incredibly detailed um and twitter is pretty detailed as well so they are really really helpful if you're looking to see who you've actually managed to attract to your page uh or your account that will then determine if you're getting the right strategy so if you are um if you're putting content out and it resonates really well with your audience, but it doesn't necessarily typify what your brand or your product is, doesn't mean to say you should keep posting those particular types of um, uh, content mm. because it's just drawing your attention into one particular thing. Um, if you're uh, trying to make sure you're getting the right kind of people, you can look at on Instagram, for example, hashtags. Hashtags will allow you to kind of like be caught up in their discovery feed. So if you have the right relevant um, topical hashtags on your post, then you can, if someone is talking about that, that thing. So again, coming back to my yoga life, um, there was an event called Sweat Life that I was at about two months ago. If I click on that hashtag, I can see anybody who was at that event who was talking about it 
what yes. they were talking about, if, what brands were selling there, what was happening. Um, and it's all kind of like clustered in there and you get to know or connect with all these different people in that space. Um, and it's the same for products. If it's, um, I talked earlier on about baby products. If I'm looking for something that is going to um, be really good, like a new cot or something, I might look at the hashtag for that product and see what people are talking about, who's tagging those type of things. Um, so you're, by adding the hashtags onto it, you're allowing people who are not following you necessarily to see it in their own feed. Yeah, that's interesting. And I guess a bit on the content, there's a point of there. So there's content and people are starting to engage when you're doing the hashtag and everything. Is there a time when, because uh, you don't want to just go in with a hard sale, um, mm -hmm. but is there a point where, for example, you link them to your product page on Amazon or your brand store on Amazon? Is there a good time when you should do that? And in terms of frequency as well? Um, again, it's like it comes back down to what is your product because uh, if you're looking at kind of like a if I was like looking at a, a, um, a portfolio of products, then you can pretty much do it kind of like well, well, very frequently because you've got lots of things you can talk about. Um, if you're maybe one or two products that you're selling, then you need to think about the rest of the the conversation. What conversation are you starting and having with your um, followers? So I would say the good 80-20 rule is great because if you did, if you were trying to kind of work out how many posts should be sales-based versus um, content that is uh, topical, timely, interesting, relevant to your audience, definitely it's the 20% only that should be the sales posts on a social media platform because social media is about community and content. And it's not about sales, but you've got your bio so lots of you on instagram it's tricky because you can't put links into the body copy of a post and people still do it i see it every day <laughs> um they're not hyperlinked so they're completely ineffective um to get shoppable instagram you, there is there are certain criteria that you only need to be able to tick to even have that kind of feature enabled on your profile I wish I could tell you what the miracle process for that was, but um, Instagram will pick and choose who they roll it out to um, as a retailer. Some people I've seen have had 250 followers and get it immediately. Other people have got thousands of followers and they haven't got it yet. So um, it's a bit of an anomaly, but once it kicks in, that's obviously a great way to do it because it's native to the platform. People know what it means now. They see a little kind of like, a handbag icon and they click on it and then the details of the product pop up and you can go straight through to, to purchase. Um, but in the bio, you can put your link there. And if you've got multiple products, there's, um, there's a great service called Linktree. Um, so you can click that and it opens up to a web page and it has the uh, little buttons on there that you can go straight through into the various um, links that are, uh, your product is behind. Interesting. Yeah, definitely. And I think there's an interesting point there where um, with Instagram is that they are creating a shopping channel almost within their app. So they're seeing this this whole customer journey that, yes, it, as you mentioned, it is community based. But then there's a point where, OK, this this customer is engaged so much in that content that maybe they actually want to then make that purchase, which just highlights the. I guess the, the, the key question here of whether or not you need social media presence um, or can you just get, you can sell just through Amazon. I guess it's more, yeah, you can sell through Amazon, but there's all this other activity going on that can drive incremental sales and grow your brand further that if you're not doing it, you're only going to get a certain piece of the pie. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, you shouldn't necessarily kind of like, have a one a one uh, laser focused approach to just going to one place to buy mm -hmm. um, because consumers are and customers are so diverse in the way they their shopping habits their social media consumption um, everything is just getting more and more fractured so if you're not you want to be not everywhere but just anywhere where the right people are 
to buy your product. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, that's really, that's really, it's, I, I mean, I've learned a lot uh, by talking to you today. It's like, this is, a, this is an area that we're definitely, by dealing with so many clients that focus on the Amazon platform, that they're looking for that additional growth and looking for that credibility to support them on Amazon and so forth and asking a lot of questions about social media. And this, this conversation has definitely highlighted that there, there is that need and it's really been really insightful. And I really hope that that's going to be really insightful for those also listening, listening to, uh, to this podcast. Um, I'm, I've taken up your time and I know time is, is precious and uh, it's now the evening for you. So I don't want to take too much time, but I do w would like to ask you one last question before we sign off. And just really, if you had to give one tip to a retail brand that's just starting out on social media, what would that be? It's the, it's the, most brilliant question. I absolutely love this question. And it's not something that I say just exclusively to retail brands, but to people. Uh, and that is define your purpose. Um, know yourself, as I said, I think it was somebody on Big Brother years ago said that, but um, <laughs> if you define your purpose, if you know who you are, what you stand for and what you're trying to be, then you can sell appropriately to the right audience. So you need to ask yourself, you know, what are you trying to do as a brand? What do you want people to buy and how do you want them to use their products? Where are they? Like, are they in the right market? Are they in the, on the right platforms? Are they buying online? Are they buying in store? Um, what, what should they consider you as, a product or a brand? Are, you, are they buying into something more? Do you need to serve them blog content as well as uh, social media content um, to be able to kind of get them to be part of your community, to be get them to be ambassadors for you uh, and how will they get to know you like how can they interact and then lastly when is the right time to act when is the right time to be topical and timely um, essentially the journey never ever ends when you're kind of like going into this space so if you're a retailer new or old don't ever think that you have all the uh, answers because the uh, digital world is evolving every single day and you need to do that as a brand as well. Um, my personal mantra has always been never to settle. And I think that's, um, that's what I would say to the rest of you. Um, but just going back to what my piece of advice is, it's define your purpose. Awesome. That's, that's really awesome. I think now I am going to go and, and just check that I have defined my purpose. And if not, figure that all out. Because... <laughs> That is a, that's a really useful, really useful tip. And as I've said, everything you've said today has really been insightful and really helpful um, for those that are in the, not yet in that social media world or that are and they're just going out there with this blanket approach and they're just not getting results yet, are spending loads, chucking loads of money uh, at lots of advertising and just questioning why they're doing it. And hopefully this will help them realize that they need to be a bit more strategic and think about, plan out what, what they should be doing when it comes to social media. So thank you. Um, it's been awesome to have you. It's uh, especially as you're a special friend of mine. And so it's been great. We've been on our best behavior for the session today, which is always good. Um, but thank you. Thank you so much. And I would love to uh, have you back on our podcast to talk more about social media because this is a huge topic. And in particular, also talk a bit more about uh, influencers that we touched on earlier as well. So thank you, Steph. Yeah. And also for those that are listening, if you um, want to hear more about Steph, you can find Steph on Instagram at Steph's Bubble. And you can also find Steph on Twitter and LinkedIn. And we'll share the links in the, uh, in the bio as well. So thanks again, Steph. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, thank you for letting me talk on my favorite subject. Awesome. Thank you.